Hey everybody, Nigel here, Nigel's Modelling Bench, and here I am back with you for part five of the B52 um, monogram slash Revell beginner's build. It's the big bad, what is it? The big bad buff beginner's build. <laughs> so, um, well, big bad buff, oh, I don't know. Anyway, um, a few of you have been doing, as I said in the first video, and you've been sending me some questions. So I've had a couple of questions come on the... Um, in the comments and um, which I've answered and I've had a couple of comments been emailed me to email to me one of the questions I had was from Barry Barry Jones and he's basically not building this model along with me he's building another one um, but he's basically using all the hints and tips that I'm sort of putting across here which is for beginners is quite handy so and, and Barry and his wife actually he uh, she's actually um, doing some work with him as well and one of the questions he asked was about the primer I used, and it was this MIG one-shot primer. So just in case you didn't see that video, I'll just go over this again. This is uh, MIG Ammo one-shot primer. I think AK do their own version. I know UMP do their own version. What it basically is, it's Badger Steiner Res. It's made in America. It's um, a fantastic acrylic primer. It's what a lot of people now use as their go-to acrylic primer. You've also got the Viejo um primer don't be confused with this and that that stuff is awful this stuff is brilliant the viejo primer will peel up you can't sand it very easily but apparently if you thin it with some mr color leveling thinners you can i've done a whole video on primers if you go back i don't know a year 18 months ago i did a whole video on primers have a look at that but um basically this stuff is a million percent better than the um than the viejo primer this, as I say, this is basically Badger Steiner Res rebottled, relabeled by, in this case, MIG Ammo. I think AK do their own. I know UMP do their own. So you've got the ultimate products in the UK. Um, they they do their own primers in all the different colours. I think there's a couple that have been dropped now, but I know there's grey, white and black. Um, I know they exist. And they are brilliant. You can hear in this one I've put a, a ball bearing in there. Um, it's a ceramic ball bearing, so you don't get the corrosion. Be careful you don't use a steel ball bearing. Um, some people say use a stainless bearing or a stainless bolt. Not all stainlesses are non-corrosive. Be very, very wary. They, some, some stainlesses are magnetic and some stainless steels are corrosive. People will tell you stainless steel is neither magnetic or corrosive. It isn't. Um, in fact, I don't know why it gets the name stainless steel if it rusts, but hey. So... Uh, there you go. Now the question was, can you use it direct or do you thin it? It is designed to be used direct, but I do know from uh, listening to people's conversations and YouTube and magazines and stuff, that it tends to thicken with age. Now, whether that's because people don't shake it up enough, don't stir it up enough, so as you get to the bottom it gets thicker, or if it just thickens with age, like every time it's exposed to the air, maybe it thickens, I don't know. But um, basically... Uh, yeah, it, it's fantastic stuff, but it does thicken with age. So what you do then is you thin it with Mr. Color Leveling Thinners. If you're on a budget and you're looking for a thinner that you can thin all your paints with, this is the one to get. This basically thins everything. I'm not sure if you can thin Viejo paints with it. I've never tried it. In fact, I need, need to give it a go. But um, I know that if you put like Tamiya thinners with Viejo paint, I think it turns into like cottage cheese. But um, I'll have to give it a go. I'm not sure if you can thin... Well, somebody will probably tell me in the comments below and then we can all read it. Um, but I know that you can thin this with this. So basically that's your way to go. So, um, so the question is, can you use it out of the bottle? Yes. Can you thin it? Yes. Use that thinner. If you've only got like a small needle in your airbrush or a small nozzle, then you may want to thin it anyway because it is quite thick and gloopy for a, for a smaller airbrush. Or don't forget, turn your pressure up. Turn your pressure up to like 35 PSI and it will paint a lot easier because it's that little bit thicker. But um, it's really, really good. And I would imagine with a drop of Mr. Color Lever and Thinners in it, it'd be even better because it'll make it... Um, yeah, make it stick to the plastic better, I would think. So that was the first question. And the second question Barry asked was, if you're doing, say, a Tomcat, and it's white undersides and light grey on the top, what colour primer should you use? I would use black. Um, I generally prime, if I'm painting something white, I generally prime with black. It gives the white some depth. Um, I think if you look at most car painters, they will use a dark primer under a white. It gives the paint depth and also you're able to see where you've actually painted. If you were trying to paint something 
grey, very light grey, white. Once you've got it done, you will see bits you've missed. If it's a military aircraft, that won't matter so much. But if it's something like an airliner, then you want it to be pure white. So if I was doing an airliner, I would paint the whole fuselage black. In fact, I paint the wings and everything black because they're silver and there's no better primer for silver than black, which is why you see I sprayed, I sprayed these wheels black. Um, so yeah, so I would definitely use black primer. If you don't have black, use this grey. It's a very dark grey. That'll be good enough. But certainly don't aim for lighter colours. Um, or if you're building a fairly newish unweathered aircraft, you could use the white primer and that's it. There's your white. And then if you want to go in with some white afterwards and do some weathering, then you can and just use the white primer as a base. So basically black primer under white every time. Um, or if you're going to do it for a fairly new model, just use a white primer or use a black primer and then the black, the white primer over the top. So there you go. There's those questions answered. Um, the other thing I want to qu quickly show you, because if you're watching this, you're probably a B-52 fan. As some of you will know, I've been working on B-52 noses. We've got the early GH here, which I haven't actually sanded the plastic away here yet, but you can see there's the basic early G. That one's all done. And uh, I've got that attached to the tail end of the I just messing about making a, a short B-52. Yeah, OK. Um, now, this is my pride and joy. And this has been probably 60 hours work, I think. So this is the B-52 nose you get if you buy a G or a later G or a H model. This is the extended nose. This isn't the original nose from the old Crow model. This is the... Um, this is the nose you get with the H or with the update kit for the uh, for the G, um, the old Crow Express late G. So we'll pop that one down there. So I have been working on this and I'm going to give you a little teaser here. I'll do a separate video on it, but I've literally just finished it. The primer is probably still, still a bit tacky. But there we go. There's my B52 G, uh, uh, sorry, late G, late H, the primer's still wet. Late G, late H nose fitted and just taped onto the model collect fuselage as you can see. But um, I'm really pleased with how it's come out. I think it looks great. This is a separate piece. This is a separate piece. These two pods here, either side, they're separate pieces. And then you've got the back of the cameras here. They're separate pieces. It's not a, it is a conversion, but it's not just a, a strap on conversion you need to do a bit of filler work and a bit of sanding and also if you notice there's no panel lines I've got that line there scribed in there for the um, opening of the radome and that's it okay so um yeah it's not just a it's not a sort of you know cut a wingtip off and glue a wingtip on it needs a bit of work to fit which is why I've left all these bits separate so you can you can work on the shape and sand it and then add these bits later there's also a couple of stiffening plates which go in behind here which you can add with some 10th hour plastic card if you want to I haven't added them because obviously this is going to be my sort of advert if you like for the uh, for the conversion but it's been a fairly rushed job getting it all together but actually getting all the finished shapes and everything i've ended up making four different molds for the nose just for that nose section there i've probably made three molds for this area here the main part it's driving me absolutely around the bend and now that it's done i'm kind of glad that it's done so i'll do a how to fit video and then we'll go from there but um yeah, this is for the this is the model collect kit. I'm also working on the same nose, but for the Italeri kit. So uh, drop me a line if you're interested. Um, I've also done wing tanks and everything, but I'm waiting for somebody. I sent somebody over a month ago now, I think. I sent them some wing tanks to try on their model as a test for me to see if they have the right angle of attack and everything. They have a nose, nose up attitude, as you know, and they still haven't done it. So I may be offering another pair free to someone, but I need someone to just get them and fit them and tell me if they work, please. So anyway, um, right, on with part five. And if you remember in part four, we did our tire painting and here's one here. This has had about three coats and I still want to give them some more. So I'm going to turn the camera off in a minute and get some more done. Um, we've got all our undercarriage bays here painted and everything um, and I think I'm going to put a wash on those and uh, and then we're going to glue it all together and we've got our undercarriage legs here if you remember they're painted and clear coated as well so that's what we're going to concentrate upon in this episode is getting a little wash on these getting a bit of a little wash on the legs 
and I'm going to get the tires finished. But you don't want to see me painting tires anymore. So I'll get those done and then I'll come back with some washing. And there we go, in your face, all blotchy and everything. But there we go, our our tires are all painted now and the wheels are all painted and, uh, and looking great. What we need now is a wash because we've got all this lovely detail in here. Let's get these out of the way. We've got all this lovely detail in the wheel. And what we want to do is pick it out and enhance it with all that lovely bolt detail and everything. So I'm going to pick it out and enhance it and give it a wash. Now, if you are an absolute beginner, as uh, David Bowie said, then you basically might want to completely ignore this part of the video. If you don't want to do it, you know, you don't have to, but it's something good to pick up going forward. Now, what I'm going to do is a wash. And basically a wash is almost like dirty thinners. It's a very, very thin wash of paint, normally black. Um, and what you do is you're going to, you've got a thing called a pin wash, and then you've got an, an all over wash. And basically a pin wash, you're going to basically pick out little tiny areas and like it might be on the back of a tank or something, you're going to pick out a few bolts or hooks or something. Or an area like on the side of an engine block, you might just paint the whole thing with a wash. And what will happen is the wash will run into all the nooks and crannies and it will highlight and it will give you a real good 3D look to your model. It really does give it some depth and character. But also in the, in the case of this, it's like where dust and dirt would pick up any oil or anything, any, any hydraulic leaks. Um, it would always, you know, get caught in the corners and the edges and, and not get cleaned off or wiped off or whatever. So basically uh, what we're going to do is make a wash. Now, there are loads of washes out that you can buy. Um, by all means, if that's what you want to do, go and buy them. But all they are really, the enamel washes, is basically enamel paint with enamel thinners or you've got oil paint with odorless thinners. Don't use turpentine on your model parts. Um, certain plastics will be affected by turpentine, particularly Bandai, the, the people who make all the Star Wars kits. If you go and put turpentine on that plastic, it just crumbles. It goes like candle mint cake. And um, so it's best to use odorless thinners. This is the one I use if I'm using oil washes. Uh, Dale around it's just because I can get it in my local hobby craft low odor thinners and basically if it's odorless it won't affect it the other thing you can also use is lighter fuel so um you know the canned lighter fuel um but for this one because it's for beginners I'm going to use stuff that's readily available off the shelf off the shelf off the shelf from your local shop you know from your local hobby store or online or whatever um if you can get some a good one is the Tamiya panel wash and it comes in the same sort of bottle as the as the Tamiya glues, um, but it's, um, it's 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 larger on the bottom, I think. But um, basically, it's this: it's enamel paint in enamel thinners. That's all it is. So um, we're going to make our own. Now I'm using gloss black paint. Please tell me in the comments below if I'm wrong, but I'm sure from memory I've used matte black paint in the past, and it all um, breaks up the the pigments. In the paint or separate and instead of having a wash where you get a line um, you end up with dots because it looks like it just all breaks up so i'm going to use gloss because i don't want it to break up obviously and as i say i'm going to use enamel thinners this is humbrol enamel thinners and humbrol enamel gloss black paint you can see it's really old so i have done a little test with this just to check that it's all okay because it is also old a bit like me so um this will open easily so we open our paint. Notice I've got some paper towel down rather than ruining my modeling board. So I'm going to take my brush. My brush is nice and clean. And I'm just going to go one, two, three, four little drops of paint on there. OK, so there's four little drops of paint on there. And we'll just put the lid back on. Now, never just put the lid back on loosely like that. OK. Always put the lid back on, even though you might want it again. If you put the lid back on loosely, you're likely to go and pick it up, thinking the lid's on there, and straight away it's everywhere. So I do the same with all my bottle paints. I always put the lid back on. I never just, I never just do this. God, blame this tight. I never just put the lid back on like that because you'll pick it up by the lid, and then you, lo and behold, you'll pick it up and it will just fall off. So always put your lids back on properly. Now for here, I'm going to use. I'm going to use one, two, three, four, that was seven. That was seven drops then. Okay, so it's roughly 25% paint, 75% thinners. But again, 
People will tell you you need to be exactly 26.3%. Oh, no. Just do it till it looks right. Um, I mean, that looks to me like it's probably a little bit too thick. It may want a bit more thinners in it, but I'm going to go with it anyway. And what I'm going to do, I have got a scrap wing here. This is a wing off a, an old Heinkel 111. And uh, I use it for decal tests and everything, as you can see. And I'm just going to put it on here and just test it and see what it's like. And yeah, it's working well. You can see see it running along those lines, so it's capillarying out well. And what you do is you just leave it on there, let it dry, and then these bits where you touch the brush, like that bit there, okay, if I touch it on there, that bit there that's raised, we'll just rub that away afterwards. So that's working well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come along with my undercarriage bay here, and I'm going to take some of the some of the thinners. Or the sum of the wash, should I say? And I'm just going to go onto there, onto there, and onto these rivets around here, like so, like this. And this is all really just for practice, okay? Um, you're probably never going to look up in your wheel well bay, and the detail on here is incorrect anyway. But um, this is all just so you can see how it goes. And if you mess up now, then it's only up in the wheel bay that you've messed up. Okay, so there we go. We put some another drop on there. And if you want to, what you can do is just paint it all over just like that. If I do one side all over. some more in there okay so do one side all over and then one side just picking up on the features and I'm also just going to put something you can see it running down there if I put another drop there you'll see they'll come along and they'll meet up in a second and if they don't you just go in the middle of the brush there you go that's that done and again I can do this all over here and this is the main reason for putting the gloss on. Okay, and then we'll do the same on here. Just put a run along there. Same on here. Put a run along there. Put a run down there. It's blowing a gale outside today. We've got the Storm Freddy, whatever it is. 55 mile an hour winds I think we've had today in Gloucester so yeah I expect there's going to be some uh, fence company share price going up in the next few days so there we go that's that done now we're going to move on to these wheels and again we're just going to touch it in we basically just touch it on the center cap here okay touch it around there and it'll run around I'll pick up on that detail and then I can just touch it in the wheel rim. Just three places should be enough. And you can see straight away that it just looks so much better. So just touch some there. Let it run round. What I'll do is I'll just go round the whole wheel with the brush, I may as well. Okay, and if you've got a bit too much on there, if you, if you think you've gone over the top, you could just remove the thinners from your brush and just touch your brush in and it will wick. It will wick the excess up. Just like so. And obviously because I'm using gloss black, it's going to end up with a kind of glossy finish on it. Well, the other thing you can do is come with a cotton bud. Yes, yeah, so because we've used gloss black, it's going to have a gloss finish on it. We can always go in afterwards with a matte varnish because we want to matte the tyres down anyway. So there you go. There's a very, very subtle effect. 
and then we can go back here we can go with the heavy effect again if we want to just put a drop in there drop in there and a drop down there and there we go So you can see it looks so much better if we put that against the plain one. You can see there, just check, you can see. You can see it just looks so much better. It picks up all the detail. So I'm going to go on and get the rest of this done, let it dry a bit, and then I'll show you what we do next. Okay, so that was like an overall wash. We, we washed all the wheels. So now on these undercarriage legs, we can do what's called a pin wash. Now, pin wash, you're actually just picking out specific parts that you really want the wash to go. So around these um, little steering controls here, these little cylinders that control the steering, around that part of the leg there. And then we'll just put some in here. Let it run around there. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the features on this leg aren't sharp enough to pick up the wash. And again, you'll see here, if you haven't done your seam work properly, then your wash is gonna pick up on your seam and it won't look too good. just pick up on there if you really want to go to town you can do these um, cylinders chrome silver if you really want to go to town on it so there's a place crying out for a bit of washing there look drop in there and we're just putting the wash actually where we want it rather than just everywhere if you want to paint all over it, what will happen is you'll basically darken the whole undercarriage leg and maybe make it look a, less, a little less um, authentic, if you like. So there we go. Okay, so you can see now that when you look at that, if you look at that undercarriage leg, Compared to the one next to it, you can see it just looks a lot. The lights reflecting, that's the trouble. But it just looks a lot more kind of authentic rather than just a piece of silver. So um, leave that. Don't worry about the excess. We'll take care of that in a minute. Um, what I'm saying is, when you go around, like if you go around here and you end up with a wide black area, don't worry about that because we're going to deal with that. That's the whole beauty of using this. Oh, and the other thing I should say, if you've used enamel paints, um, you don't want to be doing this with enamel. You'll take the paint off underneath. So if you've used enamel paints to paint your model, don't do this. You'll have to use a, a water-based wash. I think, um, I think Viejo makes some. Water-based washes are very difficult to make yourself because the water-based paints don't like to thin. They, they, they go like the matte paint, I think, does. It goes all like a pigment, or breaks down. And you end up with, like, sand instead of, instead of a smooth wash like this is. Okay, so we're just going to dab that into all the areas. And I'm going to try and get this tiny little bit that's left. I'm going to try and make it do one more leg. There we go, that's those all done. So, we just leave it all for 10 minutes now and then we'll come back to it. And just while I think of it guys, something I heard today on the internet, you have to go and see. If you go into today's day, which is the 25th of August 2020, 
Um, there's a station on YouTube called Talk Radio. They, they obviously transmit over the radio, but they also have a YouTube channel where you can watch. And from 10 in the morning till, I think it's 10 till 1 p.m., you have a guy called Mike Graham, who's absolutely fantastic. He's a great, great presenter, really, really good show. And people that phone in are really brave if they're going to argue with him because they generally lose. But today there's a discussion about the British military disposing of all their tanks. Um, and it's it's nigh on exactly 11.30. So if you, if you go into today's programme, even if it's in a week's time, have a look. 25th of August 2020 at 11.30, Mike Graham show. A guy phones in talking about how we don't need tanks um, because we can have an Apache helicopter. And it's absolutely comical. And it turns out this guy's knowledge of tanks actually was came from... Bearing in mind that Mike Graham previously um, interviewed the British commander of forces during the Afghanistan war and everything... Um, this this guy agreed, was saying that we you know we shouldn't lose all our tanks we need to keep them but this guy phones in and says no 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 we'll get rid of them because we can have Apache helicopters we don't need tanks and uh, it's absolutely comical and as I say it turns out this guy's total experience of um, of tank warfare all comes from his local museum so it <laughs> really really funny go and have a watch so um, right moving forward. Now we've got this um, this this thinner this um, thinners this wash on. We need to look at removing the excess that we don't want. So what we do is we take some of the enamel thinners again. Okay, we're just going to take a drop, just a drop of the enamel thinners in a pipette. One, two drops, nothing much. And then I'm going to take a cotton bud. Because I will use that one. I'll use a clean one. All right, so take a cotton bud. Just stick it in there just quickly, just to dampen it. We're not, see all the thinners has run into this recess around the edge. I just want it damp. I don't want it soaking wet. And then I can rub over where I've been and move, move it all around. Okay, so I can give it a dirty used look. Now I'm going to have to do this on the inside of the fuselage as well because it is actually leaving a kind, I wasn't going to bother, but it's actually leaving a streaky kind of, tarnished look to it so get some more thinners on here and I could just rub it away and if we sort of go in one direction get around there oh there's rivet detail in those recesses as well I should have put a wash in there never mind so there we go if we go in the other direction then you can see what it's doing is giving a kind of dirty look to it. There we are. And then if you want to, you can come along with a paper towel, just Wipe over with your finger, and it gives you this kind of dirty, used look. And that's the only real chance we're going to get to practice before we get to work on the actual model. But obviously, we'll do this around the engines, do this around certain areas of the fuselage, on the wings, and we'll give it some streaking and you know, give it a good sort of used look because these uh, most of the pictures you see of the D's from the Vietnam era, they did they did get a bit of a beating. So um, two other things I want to talk about. The instructions always call for gloss black. I believe they were painted gloss black, but when you look at photographs of them, they didn't stay gloss for very long. So bear that in mind. And also in the instructions, they tell you to paint these wheel caps yellow. I'm looking at pictures of D's. I can't see a single picture of a D with painted wheel caps. All the H's, they all seem to have red and blue caps. Now, I always thought the red and blue would have done it left and right, but it obviously doesn't because there's red and blue on both sides on, on various photographs. In fact, I've seen one photograph of a B-52H stood on the ground and it's got, in the picture you can see, it's got a red cap here, a blue cap here, a blue cap here and a red cap here. So 
and then it's another picture has got blue on the outside so it's not the blue and red is red it is in or out or whatever if you actually know what it is please tell me if you're having a guess please don't bother but if you actually know then please tell me I, I would have thought it would have been left and right but obviously it's not so um there we go you can see there removing the removing the oils so i'm going to go on and get the rest of this done oh i'll show you doing a wheel just show you doing a wheel let's pick a wheel up here just go over that center cap go around the rim and then just put the cotton bud in and spin the wheel round once and that'll do and the thing i did forget to do was put a wash in the back but never mind so there we go so again touch the cap go around the inside once go around the rim it just makes them all the same You can see the cotton buds because they just fall to bits. They're not as good as they used to be years ago. But then us old guys always say that, don't we? Nothing's as good as it was years ago. One thing I don't like, I'm all for saving the planet, but I can't stand these paper stems. Uh, when you use them wet, they uh, they just completely collapse on you. But um, I guess it's a small price to pay for not filling the oceans up with plastic. There we go. Oops. That wasn't supposed to happen. That didn't happen in rehearsals. Job done. So I'm just going to have to do this one now. Get those legs done the same way. Just wipe over with the cotton, with the cotton bud. Remove the excess. Leave it in the corners. Just like so. There's no real art to it. It's just a... As you can see the excess is coming off. And it's just leaving the wash in the corners where you wanted it originally to go. And there we are, you can see there, there's your finished article. I'm going to get into there. Okay, so um, hopefully if you're a beginner you've learned a lot here. Um, and hopefully you'll give it a go. But as I say, if you've used enamel paint on your model, don't do this because you'll take all the paint off that you put on. If you don't have any odorless thinners or enamel, or enamel thinners, do not use turpentine. Um, if you do, I will not be held responsible. Well, I'm not responsible for anything you do, but basically, if you use turpentine, especially with these low bearing undercarriage legs, you may well damage the plastic. And you won't see the damage, that's the problem. It, it, just, it will just sit there and slowly eat away at it, and one day it'll just all crumble up. And um, it could happen within two hours. It could take a couple of weeks. So I need to get some more thinners in there. I'll carry on with this. And there we go. All done. I've uh, Off camera, I've done the wash on the back of the wheels. And I've also done a wash on the inside of the fuselage, which I need to actually rub a bit more of that away. And that is the beauty of doing this with these enamels and oils and stuff. You could let that dry for a day and you could still come along with some... Um, some enamel thinners on a cotton bud or a rag and wipe that off and it'll just disappear. So it, it's it's one of the beauties of doing it. But as I say, you can only do it over acrylic paint. And the reason I put the gloss coat on is so that it sits on rather than soaks in. Um, like here you can see I didn't gloss coat this. And you can see that I've been trying to rub it off and I can't, it just rubs it in. So that's the thing, it becomes, matte paint has a porosity to it. So the, the, the oils will, will just soak into them. So, um, now it's come time to do a varnish. Now I'm going to do a matte varnish. I want this to be matte. I want the inside of here to be matte. I want the tires to be matte, but not the wheels. So if you look at wheels and tires, they're generally not matte on the outside edges, but they are definitely very matte 
on the tread. So all I'm going to do is get my airbrush and spray these like that and then I'll get a sort of matte going into not so matte effect which is how tyres actually are and the undercarriage legs obviously I don't want them matte so I'm not going to varnish them so we'll put those to one side out of the way and we just concentrate on these if you can hear some funny noise it's my dog below or it's a little Jess below me uh, playing with a toy so matte coat this is Humbrol Matte Coat it's basically an enamel type product they tell you to thin it with white spirit um, whether they mean you can use Humbrol Thinners or not, I don't know. If you could, I think they would say use Humbrol Thinners, but they're telling you to thin it with White Spirit. So I'm not going to use that purely because I don't want any White Spirit near my model. Here we've got another one, MP Miniature Paints. This is one I've had for years and years. I don't think I've ever used it. It's an acrylic and it can be thinned with water, So and it's waterproof once dry. That'd be interesting to see what that one's like. Um, I'm not sure if it's... God, blimey. As I said, I've had this for years. Oh, there we go. I was just about to give up. Yeah, and it definitely smells like, it smells very much like Tamiya. But as you can see, it's white in colour, so you'll see it going down. But um, obviously it's going to dry clear. Now, with all these matte varnishes, one of the main things is you need to shake them and shake them and shake them and then stir them and shake them some more. If you don't get all the matte pigment agitated into the liquid, it won't be a matte varnish. It will dry gloss. Here's the Tamiya, which is a good common one to use, XF86, fairly new one, flat clear. You can see I've got air written on there. I've already thinned this one, ready for the airbrush. So you'll see when we look inside, it's kind of slightly milky and it's also very thin because I've thinned it. So that's another really good one and it's a good hard wearing one. This is the um, AK Ultra Matte Varnish. Again, you need to shake the Lividelics out of this one, otherwise it won't dry matte. But it is very, very matte. It is extremely matte. Downside to it, it's not very hard wearing. So I'm not going to use it on here because I'm going to be handling the wheels when I fit them and everything. And it's, you know, um, it's not very hard wearing. It'd be okay for the undercarriage bays, but no point in using two different varnishes. Then we've got our MRP, super clear matte varnish. Um, really, really good product. Very hard wearing. Doesn't dry totally matte. It's not as good as the matte var ultra matte varnish from matte. But it stinks and it is hard wearing. And we've got this one here, which is a pretty good all-rounder. Uh, clear coat flat. This is all clad. You can sell this for years. £4.95 is probably about eight quid now. Um, and again, you can see I've got some balls in there to, to agitate it. But again, you get this, this sludge build up on the bottom. You need to make sure it's all suspended in the liquid, otherwise you won't get a matte varnish. It's quite good, a little bit smelly. Um, yeah, I think it's gonna be like a like a cellulose product. I haven't used this for a long time. If you look back on um, large scale planes, there was a group build many years ago on um, on F4 Phantom. I did I did an F4 Phantom on there and I used that on there. So yeah, if, if you look up on the, those at the time I never finish anything, have a look on large scale planes and see that the Phantom build. I think it was called the Tomb build or something. Um, if you look in group builds history and you'll, you'll see it in there. I did two. I did a Revell and a, and a Tamiya one. Uh, it's also on the Flory Models website as well. I did the group build on there with it. Um, so there we go. So that's all the matte varnishes that I've got. I've also got the Humbrol matte varnish. Um, I don't have Viejo matte varnish because it's probably not very good. Um, and that's about it, really. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose which one I'm going to use. And I'm going to do the engine, the engine bay, the undercarriage bays. And I'm just going to do the edge of the tyre. So when we do it, we'll do it on camera. So I've decided I'm going to use this one because I've used it for years. And it is quite a good flat clear. It's not dead flat, but it is um, it is quite flat. So the beauty of this one is, it's just use it straight from the bottle. Let's just pour a drop in there. We don't need much. So again, put the lid back on. Always put your lids back on. And then just do a little test. Yep, in fact, I'm going to grab a piece of paper. Because I can't see the matte varnish on the uh, on the towel. You can see it there. Okay, so just going to come across. And with the matte varnishes, you always put them on very thin. If you pile them on, they won't be matte. Okay, so you can see the effect we're getting there. And I should be doing this in the booth, and I should have a mask on. But I'm not. So there we go. And again down here, we just put it down on here. OK, 
coming from all the angles, make sure we get everywhere. And there you can see now we've got the effect of a dirty undercarriage bay, which is quite dull, but not totally matte. And here we go, that's just the that's just one simple weathering effect that anyone can do. So um and it can just add just that bit of depth. It's just you know just instead of just having it green or, or zinc chromate, it's it's got a bit of effect to it. So that was totally a beginner's tip. And then I could come along here, do the same in the walls of the undercarriage bay. Like this. And it dries practically instantly, so I'm out of varnish, we'll get some more. Let's just grab another drop in there. And then you just blow that one in the same. There we go. So I'll give these another coat. And it also seals in any weathering you've done. Anything, that, anything that's a bit fragile or whatever, you can just seal it in. Now comes the tricky bit. We need to do these tyres, but I don't want to do the wheels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the wheel pretty true on the stick, like so. And I'm literally going to spray it. And spin the wheel around so I've got... Just dry that off. So now you can see we've got matte. I'm going to give it another coat, I think. So you can see we've still got our sheen on the side of the tyre. We've still got the sheen on the wheel. But we've got... We're just blowing air. I'm not painting here. It's just air to dry it back. You can see we've got a pretty matte tread. Okay, so that's the effect we're after there. Now if you want to go really matte, you could use this one here, this ultra matte varnish. But as I say, it's not very hard wearing, so probably not the best idea to use that one on the wheels. And there we go, we've got the same again. And we'll just do the same on all eight of them. There we go. I'll get the rest of these done and then I'll be back. Right, here we are then, back with the instructions. So let's get some building done. We've done enough of painting, haven't we? So um, step one is having us assemble the undercarriage legs and put the wheels on. As I said at the beginning, we're not going to put the wheels on yet because it's just going to make the undercarriage easier to get broken. So it's unfortunate we have to have it, but we have to put the undercarriage in now. So um, we're going to take our port fuselage half here and basically put it across the bench so you can see what I'm doing here we go and I'll do the front one first so we need the larger of the undercarriage bays we've got the narrow ones here and the wider ones here and what it's telling us to do is fit these in okay and then the undercarriage legs are going to go in but what I'm going to do is the undercarriage leg actually goes in like this and you can see this little nub in here with a slot let's use a knife to point slot in there it looks like that undercarriage bay roof slips in there and then when we can put the undercarriage bay in undercarriage leg in sorry it's going to go in like so okay and that's going to hold that in place it's all a bit sort of all over the place and it looks like they're having us put the undercarriage roof above those pegs rather than below them which is very strange so let's just look at this again so I'm going to hold that in place like that so that's 
that's down in that groove in there so that's going to slot in like so okay so I'll hold that together like that and then slot the undercarriage leg into the undercarriage bay and we've got these two pins here one there one there they're going to go into those two holes there and there and then you've got this bit at the top which is going to go into that slot in the roof of the fuselage see we've got a bit of fluff on there we'll get that off so as you can see I haven't done this off camera so I you're sort of experiencing the how it all goes together the same time as I am and it looks to me like it goes like that okay so it's the, the, the undercarriage the bay roof is kind of stopping the undercarriage from going in properly by the look of things it's jammed hard up against the side of the fuselage ah, because I haven't got it in the right place that's why so if we put the undercarriage leg into those holes first and then try and fit the bay roof we can't do it It actually looks as though they want us to put that undercarriage bay roof above those pegs, not below them. And then it fits together fine. Okay, that's a bit um bit weird, but never mind. What I'm gonna do, I'll turn the camera off. I'm just gonna have a quick look at the Revell instructions and see how they do. Right, now the Revell instructions have you fit the bay roof to the undercarriage legs before you go anywhere near the fuselage. So basically, uh, they've got an assembly here going in, on the other side they've got the same here again and you can see when you look at this picture here you can see that those pegs are actually indeed below the parts so normally you would think that those these undercarriage bays would kind of fit in here like this up against there but nope they go above so you're going to see those those pins sticking through so a bit weird bit strange but it does fit very well indeed when you fit it like that now I'm going to leave this bay roof loose because I want it to line up when the two fuselage halves go together. So when I've got the other side built up, I intend to put the fuselage halves together, line them up and then put some glue in afterwards. So now we know how it goes, what I'm gonna do is take that out of there and I'm gonna take some of this Revell contactor and I'm gonna put a nice big drop in there, a nice big drop in there. Okay, now a lot of people will tell you you should remove the paint first with these hotter glues of today, you don't really need to worry about it, especially if you've been using acrylic paint, they will burn through. So don't worry about removing the paint, don't make a, a, a big fuss about it. So that's sat in there like that now. Okay, so we've got the, the undercarriage leg, is sat in that hole in that hole and that peg there. So I'm gonna now come along with my extra thin, put a nice big drop of that in there, just to weld that in. And then just to help this bottom one, I'm going to put a drop in there and I'm going to put a drop in there around where those pins go. And now you can see we've got our first undercarriage leg in. In fact, other than the wheels, this is our first bit of assembly. Oh no, we've done all the drop tanks there, haven't we? And be careful when you put the fuselage down, it's going to try and push that leg up. So we need to place the fuselage on something like on the corner of a box or something. So I shall drag the box over like so and then we can sit it on, on the box like that. And then I'm going to grab another undercarriage leg. I'm going to put this in there like that. And then I'm going to take some of my Revell contactor and once again, just check you're on camera, I'll put a drop in there and put a drop in there. Oopsie daisy. So that's the contact to finish with. Hold this all together, not like that. Hold it all together like that. And then slip this in to the gap. And 
This is not easy. There we go. And then just push that down in like so. So that's all gone in together. Nice and solid. Now I've noticed that the fuselage here is pushing up on the undercarriage leg, so we're going to have to clamp that somehow. But I'm going to put a drop of extra thin down in there under that pin, and I'm going to put a drop of extra thin down in here, and I'm going to put a big drop of extra thin on the top there. Get that all welded into place. Now, as far as clamping that goes. Um, I don't quite know how I'm going to, let me see what I can find in my clamps box. I don't think a clothes peg is going to do it. It might be a bit too strong. Yeah, that's a bit too, a wooden clothes peg. I don't think a wooden clothes peg, no. Um, I've got these little G clamps, maybe I could put a little clamp in there. But I need to hold it together somehow. So let me just go off camera a second, sort myself what I'm going to do. And then we'll go from there. Okay, so there we go. There's the uh, they're both clamped in place. I noticed the front one was lifting out slightly as well. So what I can do now that that's clamped in place, I can take some extra thin and just put it in. Where are we? You go on the camera. Just put it in there, and just make sure that's glued in as well. So we'll have a nice solid fitting undercarriage in there now. So it's glued to the top, it's glued to the sides, and it's glued to the bottom of the fuselage. So it should be nice and strong. And there we go. So that's them in. Now I've only got two clamps like this, so I can't do any more assembly. Because I was going to go on and put the other side in as well, but the, although the instructions don't call for that. So we're going to push this to one side. And we're going to look in our instructions and see what's next. And it's telling us next we're going to put these bomb bays in, the bomb bay doors in. Um, now, I intend to build mine with the door shut, but what I'll do is I'll first of all assemble it. If you want to do have yours so you can open and close them, I'll first of all assemble it and show you how we do that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to work on this side. Okay, I'm going to work on this side rather than the other side because it's, it's supposed to be all done into the port fuselage, the left hand side. Um, I'm going to work on the starboard side which is over here at step seven on the instructions um, just basically to make to because I don't want to be messing with this while it's got these clamps on. So what we'll do is we'll first of all get the parts so I need door number 15 and hinge retainer 17. So looking through the sprues there's is that hinge retainer 17 yes it is it's got 17 written on it and then we've got our bombay doors let me turn the camera off and get these right, that i've got the right quandary there with everything everything trying to fight me so we're going to take these parts off the sprues that's so that's 17 so that's that one there and then we want the door number 15 and they've got the Bombay doors angled on one end and I'm not sure 100% if that's correct I don't think they're supposed to be but um, I will check my references maybe the D was different I've also noticed on this one they've got the um, the actual cargo the crew entrance door off to one side and I'm sure it's supposed to be in the center so uh, Maybe this kit isn't the 100% accurate model it's all cracked out to be. Or maybe the others are wrong. Well, we know the others are wrong, don't we? So, there we go. So that's our sprue nibs removed. Sand it off using our Infini stick. Now this is going to go on facing downwards, like so. So I'm going to take that, sand that 17 off just in case it gets in the way. I love it when manufacturers put the part number actually on the part because it makes it a lot easier to identify them once they're off the sprue, obviously. There we go, we've just got some 
pin marks on there, so we just sand those away. Like so. And then I'm going to come in with my little P skinny sander right here and just sand away that sprue nib there. Again, note I'm using a hard sander rather than, than a sponge because I don't want to get rid of that sharp edge. Okay, so we've got three sprue nibs on there. So they're all gone and cleaned up. A little bit more clean up on that one. Just like so. You can see we've got these little lumps on here. They're to stop the door falling in. So they're sort of not accurate. They're they're more of like a toy-like feature. Um, so basically our door is going to sit in there like that. So we've got we've got three hinge points, one, two, three. And they're going to sit in those slots like so. So then your doors will, op will open and close just like that. Okay. And then the this part here, 17 is going to go in like so. Now you've got these, these pins here, these pins here obviously to um, help locate the hinges in place. So that's going to go in like that, I'm guessing, sat on those pads. And that is going to hold the, hold it in place. And then you your Bombay doors will actually close like so. So basically what you're going to do, it's probably best to use the contactor type glue here so you don't get it going everywhere. Uh, one of the problems with extra thin, it will capillary under everywhere. So if you want this to work, you might be better off using a, a small drop of the contactor glue initially, just like so. And if you want to, you can come in with a knife blade and just scrape away the paint there, but the glue will dissolve it. As you can see, if I wipe my finger over there, you can see the green in the in the glue. It's dissolved the paint straight away. So you don't need to worry too much about um, removing the paint from the surfaces, unless it's a, a critical item, which is you know needs to be strong. Okay, so that's going to glue like that. And then what we can do is come on the extra thin. And whereas I would normally just take the brush out the bottle and put it on, I will brush the soap some off. And we could just add some in like that, brush some off, add a drop in, and it'll just give it a little helping hand. Okay, so now we've got basically, and what I can do here is put a little drop under there because those pins are just touching there. So you've got two pins there for this side, and then those two pins there work on the other side because obviously you've got two part 17s so they've made one only had to make one mold rather than make a left and right hinge retaining plate okay so there we go so that's our that's the first stage bomb doors you can see here they've got scribed out the second lot so when the with the b52 when they drop the bombs they open so the bombs drop out when they need to load them they actually they open here as well so they open out on the sides and you can um and you can have your model displayed or, or so they can get the actual bomb trolleys underneath. If you check your references or look at Google B-52 bomb loading, you'll see what I mean. There is actually a video on YouTube that shows them training on how to do it. So you can see there with the bomb bays working, you've got these two nubbins on the end, which stop the bomb bay doors falling in. Um, but you can see that with them actually working, you've got some nasty gaps along there. You've got some nasty hinge lines there. So I'm basically joining this bill. I'm going to have my, my, my doors shut. So I will show you how to do that. Um, and I'll be doing that probably in the next part because we need to put some tabs in here to glue them to, get them all solid, and then we'll do some work around these hinges and everything. And we'll look at some reference photos and we'll see what, what needs to be there and what doesn't. Um, but certainly I don't want to build a model that looks like a toy with these working parts. So I'll probably be doing the same with the spoilers. I'll probably do the same with the flaps. I will probably take away the toy-like attitude 
but as I say whenever whenever we come to parts like that I will show you how to do it so that it works like here you've got your bomb bay doors working um, you have to pull them out this way you have to pull them this way out up towards the camera before they'll open so god knows how you'd open them <laughs> when they're in the model because they catch on this edge here so there we go so I don't know how long this has been but I've reached a point now where I need to let the glue go off um, both on here and on the undercarriage door on the undercarriage so basically we're going to call that a day for now for part five and then I will be back with you for part six in the next day or two and we will get the other undercarriage legs in although it's out of sequence okay we'll get the other undercarriage legs in get the other bomb bay doors in and then I'll show you how to make those all fixed up and solid should you want to follow me on that one and then we're going to be into the cockpit and painting the pilots and stuff and the rear gun so I think part six is going to cover the bomb bay doors and this and we'll probably build up the cockpit and perhaps private and go from there so it will come together after this very very quickly so um thanks for watching i hope you've enjoyed it um any comments or questions please write them down below or you can email me at nigel's modeling bench at gmail.com and um as i say if my response is a bit short and sweet it's not because i'm trying to be rude or ignorant it's because i've had a load of questions so um thanks for watching guys i will see you all soon Bye for now.